You're listening to Scaling Up Services, where we speak with entrepreneurs, authors, business experts, and thought leaders to give you the knowledge and insights you need to scale your service-based business faster and easier. And now, here is your host, business coach, Bruce Eckfeld. Welcome, everyone. This is the Scaling Up Services podcast. I'm Bruce Eckfeld. I'm your host. And today, I will say, is actually quite a special episode. Uh, we've got John Willero on the line here. We're uh, going to talk a little bit about the work that he's done. And my guess is you probably don't need much of an introduction for most of the people that are on here. But for those that haven't run across your work, John wrote uh, Built to Sell. Uh, he also wrote The Automatic Customer. He has built the Value Builder system, which I'm quite familiar with through both my work with EO and Gazelles and Vern Harnish, and runs the uh, Built to Sell podcast. So, John, welcome to the program. I'm, thank you so much for taking some time. I'm really excited for this conversation. Yeah, no, my pleasure, Bruce. Thanks for having me. So, and, you know, what we're focused on here is really talking to the the business owners, the key executives inside companies that are service-based companies. And, you know, I kind of use it in a, in a somewhat loose term, but it's basically companies that at some level are dealing with people providing some kind of service to other people and have to kind of deal with that, that factor, that factor in the business. And when we look at scaling those businesses, uh, there's, you know, there's complexities come up and, you know, particularly, you know, like your story and the work that you've done, because you have sort of tackled the space pretty much head on. And I know through hearing your personal story and building your business and selling your business and the whole value builder system is really kind of looking at how do you take kind of those, uh, those qualities, those complications of service-based businesses and structure them, frame them, systematize them in a way that, that makes them more scalable, more valuable, more sort of ultimately sellable. So, you know, I'd, I'd be curious to talk with you a little bit about, I guess, at first sort of giving people here that haven't heard a bit of your story, like what the background is, because the experience that you have in research and, you know, looking at the small business market is great. And then let's talk a little bit about some of the key things you see in the challenges to business owners and that I know you've got eight points in the system. Let's pick out a few that you think are particularly challenging and what are some of the things that you've seen people succeed around that? Sure. Happy to do all that. Where, where do you want to start? <laughs> Well, so it's, it's give people a summary of the background because I think that's important to, for people to know that you're not just you're just not an author who you know came up with this idea, but you actually went through a journey of of actually building and and scaling your own service business. Yeah, so I've been involved in a few startups where people were the main asset in the company, and uh, so I've had a, a graphic design studio similar to uh, to the book Built to Sell. There's a there's a protagonist in that book called Alex Stapleton who runs a graphic design studio. So I've, I've owned one of those. So that was close to home. I've owned a quantitative market research business, again, a fairly um, people-driven business, frankly, projects and stuff like that. And, uh, you know, an event company as well. So uh, all of them have been one service or another. And of course, those are very difficult to to sell, which which I wrote about in, in the book, uh, you know, the, the challenge of of ultimately scaling and ultimately selling a service-based business when the assets go up and down the elevator, as David Ogilvy said in his book, that's the uh, that's the challenge. And so I've done it, and uh, and and I've lived the difficulty as well. It's you know part of the reason I think a lot of businesses start off as services businesses, obviously, is that there's no capital, very little yeah, capital. They're anyway, easy to right? start. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you don't have to raise a lot of money. You can just kind of put out a shingle and start, and and pretty soon you're. Your way to the races. The only challenge is, of course, that you're not building any value if if it's just deeply dependent on on you or on you know on a couple of key yeah. staff. So so the challenge is how do you move from the scrappy bootstrap startup days when you're you know doing anything and everything to to something that would be transferable value as they talk about in yeah. uh, in M&A's parlance. Yeah. So and and talk to me because I think the you know the value bill system has the eight kind of eight factors or eight things we look at when we're looking at how sort of sellable a company is or, or the things yep. that we can do as owners, operators of service businesses to make them more attractive or, or able to sell. I'm curious what you see around what happens for the individual. Like what do you see that the individual transformations need to be as as they kind of think about the basis, think about the business and how to make those transformations? Because I think that there's kind of a logical side of how how do you make these transformations, but what are the kind of mental hurdles or mental challenges that you see people trying to implement this, whether they need to kind of reframe or rethink about or, or change the way they're approaching a situation to be successful in this? Yeah, I, I think the biggest mental hurdle 
is to stop chasing revenue. I think, you know, for for really ever in a day, we have thought about revenue being our, you know, our number one driver, right? So, you know, the magazine cumbers celebrate revenue. The Inc. 500 is the 500 fastest growing companies. They've expanded to now the 5,000 fastest growing companies. It's top line revenue focused. And unfortunately, revenue often competes with value. There's a relationship between the two and growing companies get better valuations for sure. But there are seven other drivers of value beyond just growth that often compete with growth. Yeah. So let me give you an example. Like, so a service-based company that, you know, the classic would be the owner is the, is the, you know, is the company's best salesperson. If you wanted to maximize the revenue of that business, you'd put the owner on the road, right? You'd make the owner the number one salesperson. You push all of the, the actual, all the other stuff related to running a company off of his or her plate and just get them out in front of customers. Yeah. And you would, you would successfully grow your top line revenue. And at the same time, you would undermine the value of your company. And so you end up just kind of just running on this treadmill where you're actually not creating anything other than just more work for you as the CEO. So that's it. even scaling up, even even yeah. Burns book, even the work all around growth, growth's important ingredient in driving value. But if it's at the expense of the other seven drivers, it, it actually is a fool's errand, you know? And yeah. so what, what we need to do is get growth but in an intelligent way, in a way that doesn't undermine the other seven values. Yeah, I, and I, I agree. I think the, the, one of the things that I always kind of, uh, you know, tell founders, tell uh, entrepreneurs looking to grow is the, the faster you want to grow, the more you need to focus, you know, so the, the more you need to not start chasing everything with a dollar sign on it and really decide, like, what is the core customer? What is your core product? What is your core service? And how do you zero in on those so you can make those repeatable, scalable, you know, building quality, building systems, train people. Um, so, yeah, so I, I, I like that one. What So in, in terms of the eight drivers that you see, what, what do you think is the sort of the, the first one or maybe the, the first one that's most challenging that people kind of run up against uh, from the services yeah. sector? Well, it actually goes back to your point, Bruce, around, around focus. You know, we have this, there's a driver called the monopoly control. And what it comes down to is this idea that when a buyer buys a company, you know, without you in the room, when they're back in their boardroom at head office, they're making a, a simple calculation, right? Which is, should we buy this company or should we compete with it? Should we essentially build what they've yeah. created? And if what you've built is very easy to replicate, meaning you're a commodity-based business, you're selling by the inch, by the pound, you know, yeah. by the truckload, there's very little that makes you unique, that the barriers to entry are very low, the buyer is going to look at this and say, well, I could buy this business for 10 million bucks or I could lose, let's say, 500 grand a year for the next three years and basically take all their market share. Well, if they choose to like basically compete by lowering the price and lose a million five, they're still way ahead of spending $10 million to buy your business. Yeah. And that's really the, the, the kind of the key. And so what you want to do as an owner, I think – is find something on which you are truly differentiated, that really competing with you on that one product, that one service is very tricky or very difficult for someone to replicate. Yeah. And that's where you've got the monopoly control. And that's where when an acquirer makes a decision, they're going to look at this business and say, yeah, we could create what he's or she's got, but man, it's going to take six years and about 50 million bucks to replicate what these guys have built. Let's just go buy them for 10. Yeah. That's a key. That's a key headspace uh, shift. Yeah, that's a critical one. It's, it's basically you're you're they're buying you because they it, it's cheaper than doing it themselves. And I think a lot of entrepreneurs don't realize that the, the, you know the value is in the eye of the, the acquirer, <laughs> not yeah. not in the eye of the person that's getting acquired. Yeah, yeah, and, and it comes back down to again. I want to riff on this idea a little yeah. bit, Bruce, with the, the idea of focus. Because for a lot of business owners, again, those chasing revenue as their report card, as their sort of top line bogey, what what we do is is oftentimes we'll start off with a vision, right? So you know we, we want to create, uh, again, in the case of built to sell, the, the protagonist says he he wants to create uh, logos, right? Mm -hmm. And he's got sort of a unique a unique methodology he's developed for that. 
what we get tempted by, and, and there are just sort of all of these temptations all over the place of selling additional services, right? Because clients who buy the one thing that you're really good at will quickly start asking you for other things, yeah. right? Well, I know you do logos, but could you also do our search engine optimization, for example? <laughs> or could you build us a landing page? Yeah. And the more you say yes to that stuff, chances are the less differentiated you are on those other products. When you go to sell your company, you're going to want a multiple of EBITDA or multiple of revenue. The challenge is the buyer is unlikely to want to pay for all the ancillary stuff. Mm -hmm. They might be willing to pay you a multiple of EBITDA or revenue if you just if all you did is that one thing. But if if you've got nine other services that you're not really differentiated offering on, they're going to discount or in fact choose not to want to pay for those nine other services. Yeah, exactly. They're going to take that out of the revenue stream. They're going to say, look, I, all I'm really buying is this one particular service offering you have. That is. 5 million out of your 10 million. So I'm only going to take the five and take my multiple on that because that's really all I'm going to scale. Yeah. How much, yeah, exactly. when you go to look at sort of those strategic choices, how much should an owner look at what sort of internal factors, like how, what am I good at? What can we create significant value around versus on external factors in terms of where the, where the market opportunities are, where a particular customer might be strategically value in terms of an acquisition scenario. So if I serve yeah. these type of customers, that, that's actually strategically valuable for my potential acquirers, and so therefore it's going to increase my multiple. Yeah. At this point, you know, again, I, I'm going to zig where I think a lot of people zig. The, you know, a lot of people, if you if you pick up a wannabe entrepreneur magazine, like if you pick up Entrepreneur Magazine, right, which is read by people who don't actually run companies, it's run by people who dream about running companies, or you watch Lions or, or Shark Tank yeah. or, or any of those kind of shows that, that actually real business owners generally don't consume, yeah. they will tell you that you should start a business around your passion, right? Find something you're passionate about. Go do that. That's going to be the secret to creating a great story. business. <laughs> and and the, and actually, I think that puts you at a disadvantage. If you're super passionate about blockchain, if you're super passionate about outdoor adventure, in some ways, the worst thing you can do is start a business in that area because all of a sudden you're going to be personally very tied to yeah. its iteration, right? Whereas I think some of the most successful entrepreneurs never fall head over heels in love with what you know, whatever product or service they're building. And they're instead focused on, okay, what does the market need? What is the market saying? It's not to say they don't they don't have an interest in the area, but they're not so passionately, personally, you know, wrapped up in that product that it becomes kind of part of who they are, you know? Yeah. I, I mean, it, it's a bit of a paradox, I find, because it's one of those, like you want to sell the business, but if you're emotionally attached to it, you'll find all sorts of ways to thwart the, <laughs> thwart the sale. Like I always, I always right. say that the moment that we start talking about selling a business with an entrepreneur, the first thing we do is start figuring out their next business because we want to create pull. Like we want to, we want to get them excited about doing something else because we need to create that positive pressure for them to actually disengage from that business. And if they don't, if they don't have that next thing lined up, it is crazy the things they do to undermine the actual process, either directly or indirectly in the sale process. Yeah, yeah. such a such a good point. Yeah, yeah. I mean, having something else it doesn't have to be another business. I love no, exactly. Uh, Bruce, go, of another start, business. It could be. Yeah, go start a nonprofit. Go, you know, decide you're going to climb Everest. Like you got to, you have to kind of create some kind of mission for them that gets them excited, so that they they start wanting to leave because they, if the, the moment that they the moment they have something else, they're more than willing to make the changes to engage in the activities they need to do to disengage from the business. Um, yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. A, it's a, a psychological one. So, what else in terms of the factors that you see around you know the services businesses, other things that people run into, or kind of challenges that you'd have people kind of pay attention to because people often get wrong. Yeah, I mean, you know, in terms of, of scaling the, the business, one of the keys is going to be recurring revenue, right? So, again, a lot of service businesses are still based on project or hourly yeah. billing, and that's a that's a tough business to sell. So, what you're really trying to do is is rethink the model around some sort of recurring revenue model. That's yeah. going to be critical. So, you know, there are nine different recurring revenue models we we look at, but virtually every business can create at least some recurring revenue. But it does require you, I think, to think quite laterally about yeah. your business. A lot of people a lot of people say, well, I, you know, that's just not the way my industry works, right? Like I'm, a, I'm an accountant. I'm a, I'm a civil engineer. That's just not the way architecture works, right? And, and so you, you do, I think, have to think quite laterally. I, I, I recall a, someone I know quite well who's unfortunately passed away. He, um, he was a divorce lawyer. And, you know, people would say, well, you can't create recurring revenue from divorce law, right? Like it's, I mean, it's by its very nature, yeah. it doesn't lend itself to, to recurring revenue. 
Well, he was kind of sick of dealing with all these angry people and that, that you have to deal with through a divorce. And so he developed something called the Divorce Mediation Kit. And so it was a methodology to, yeah. of going through a divorce without actually using a an attorney. Mm-hmm. And he licensed this system to marriage counselors on a recurring basis. And so, you know, he had to think quite laterally about the industry that he was in. If he would, if he was, you know, clinging to the definition of what a law firm does, bills by the hour, then sure, it's difficult to create recurring revenue. Yeah. But if you're, if you're willing to think more laterally about what is the value exchange here, what am I actually doing? And you can start to start, you know, riffing on ideas if if you're willing to think quite laterally about your industry, your business. Yeah, I think that's. Uh- Excellent point. Excellent strategy. And I think that it's it's a lot of the ways the service businesses, so the situation they get in is they're they're in some kind of, you know, time based costing, you know, pricing model and getting into more of a some kind of content program process model where they're abstracting themselves out of the actual delivery process, you know, is often an effective strategy. So what other kind of recurring revenue schemes? Because I know that, you know, everyone talks about recurring revenue, but I, you know, you, you talk about there's, there's many different types. Give me some examples yeah. of the different types of recurring revenue that we can think about. Yeah, sure. I mean, um, you, you know, one simple one is the consumables, right? So the consumables model is based on the idea that people run out of stuff, right? Mm-hmm. So classic would be amazon.com. So, so they've got Amazon subscribe and save, right? Mm-hmm. Where if you subscribe to a shipment of toilet paper, uh, paper towel, and dish soap, and and you pick the same delivery date for those three products, they'll knock 15% off, and it's a subscribe and save. So you basically get it auto shipped. That's a consumable. So here you're looking for uh, if you're looking at your customer base, like what do they run out of? Um, you know, in a service business context, you might think about. Uh, you know, like W Promote in Los Angeles, as an example, is an SEM company, search engine yeah. marketing company. They sell you Google AdWords, Bing Words, and, and various different advertising uh, solutions. So W Promote works on a six-month recurring contract, right? And they say, look, you know, these buying these words is a hassle, right? You got to bid for them. You got to figure out your bidding. You got to optimize your bidding. You got to know what's working, what's not. It always changes. So let us manage it for you on a recurring basis. So W Promote has something like 90% plus recurring revenue, very sellable company uh, yeah. as a result of that. They're in the service business because they figured out what is that the customer has a need on a regular basis. We call that the simplifier bo- um, uh, model, by the oh, way. Interesting, yeah. Where you know the customer in many cases would would actually prefer to buy from you on subscription. Well, so the interesting any... thing there is that it's really it's it's not only the cost reduction. You know, I'm saving fifteen percent, but it's making it easy. You know, I think that's a lot of what, what people don't realize is that I think the real value in a lot of those models is that you're actually selling ease to the customer. You're, you're taking the burden of having to you know every month you know find a new actually sit down and do this work. Like we take that work for you, so you don't have to think about it. Yeah, absolutely. And so for service companies, again, that's probably a service contract. The simplifier model, the classic iteration of service business would be a a service contract. So it would be, you know, hey, we're probably going to keep doing business together. So an accounting firm is an example. Instead of billing by the hour, which many of them used to do, now most of them are moving to, hey, look, we usually bill you about five grand a year to do your tax return, to be sort of an advisor to you throughout the year. You know, instead of kind of doing this once and and, and having this, this big not at the end of the end of the year or having it fluctuate from one yeah. month to the next. Why don't we just bill you a flat, I don't know, 500 bucks a month. Yeah. And, um, and we'll just keep doing that until you tell us to stop yeah. and we'll roll all our services into that. Yeah. Again, that's a simplifier model. And you think, well, why would it matter? Well, it, it matters both for cash flow because in the old days that, you know, they would have to do the tax return, uh, submit the tax return, and then maybe get paid 60 days later. Instead, yeah. they're getting paid throughout the year. Big, you're you're big running ahead of schedule rather than behind schedule. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And um, and the customer's happy, right? Because they don't have to think about it. They just know that they're they're sort of taken care of. My son, for example, plays guitar yeah. and um, he's 10. So we have someone come to the house once a week to help him out and, and teach him a little bit. And this teacher's like, uh, he's, he's a great guy, but he's got no business acumen whatsoever. So, so every week, um, the only, only currency he takes is cash. And every week we got to find a new time for him to come yeah. to the house. So, so, you know, like my wife and I turn to each other every, every morning and say, like, Who's is Michael yeah. coming today? <laughs> do, do we have like, I, I think he charged, I, I want to say he charges 30 bucks or something. Yeah. We have the cash. Um, what time? Like, it's all just a mess, right? Yeah. As opposed to if he said, look, you know, I'll bill you 30 bucks a week on a credit card. Yeah. I'll be, you know, we'll be at the same time. It, you know, it's, it's a simple model, but it, it does make a huge difference. Make it easy. 
So, John, yeah. I, we're, we're at time here, so I wanted to give you a chance. So if people want to find out more about you, about your books, about the Value Builder System, what, what's the best way to get a hold of you, best place to find out more information? Yeah, just valuebuilder.com. Great. So I'll, I'll make sure that stuff is in the, in the show notes. People have the links. John, it was a pleasure. I, I know we didn't, there's probably another three hours that we could go on. We can do another episode again, but this was a great chance to talk with you. I really appreciate it. Cool, Bruce. Thanks. It's fun to be here. Thanks, John. Take care. Cheers. You've been listening to Scaling Up Services with business coach Bruce Eckfeldt. To find a full list of podcast episodes, download the tools and worksheets, and access other great content, visit the website at scalingupservices.com. And don't forget to sign up for the free newsletter at scalingupservices.com slash newsletter.